Becky grew up in northeastern Ohio. She learned about gardening and about uh, love of nature from her father. And then from her mother, who ran a catering business, she learned to cook. And she learned to be very discriminating in her choice of ingredients. She then went on to study nutrition, which is another step on this journey toward this book. Her father then was diagnosed with diabetes. And she wrote the book, The All-Natural Diabetes Cookbook, to help him and others who are suffering from this uh, health epidemic, which is largely food related. Um, her current book, which you have, The Big Green Cookbook, is the next step on this journey, which shows you how to make good food choices, both for yourself and for the planet. I'd like to uh, ask everyone to give a big round of applause to Jackie Nugent. Introduction, Daniel. And I just wanted to chat a little bit more about that journey in detail because I, I think it's, uh, you'll probably understand me a little bit better where I'm coming from with how I started. And, and it did start with my dad. And I didn't even know that I was on the journey to Big Green Cookbook, obviously, when I was three or four years old. But it all makes sense from um, how I was raised. And my dad uh, would take us hiking. And we, he made sure we understood what every plant's name was. And I got poison ivy many times before I learned my lesson there. But he also bought uh, all the, ch the children, all of us children, trees. And we got to plant whatever we wanted to under our trees. And I just really didn't know that this was called nature or gardening or anything special. I just thought this is just what everyone does. And it just became part of, kind of just part of my, my being, just being out in nature and, and appreciating it. And then with my mom, who was a caterer, I would go shopping with her everywhere and it was really startling what what would happen when we would go to uh, this one specialty produce market that my mom trusted and every time we would go there this produce manager would go run and hide and I thought that's really strange why is he doing that and then I realized that he would be coming back with all of the freshest fresh of the produce that he had set aside for my mom. So everyone in town knew who my mom was and knew that she wanted only the best and freshest and most, the, the most local of all the ingredients available. And I just thought it was just, it was just part of eating yummy food. I didn't know what it really meant. Um, and I think the, a couple of the most interesting things about doing that with my mom. One was uh, going up to, on Tuesdays only, because that's when the, the chicken was fresh and only from Case Farms, which my mom trusted. So I only knew fresh chicken. And my mom fr was famous for her fried chicken. So not that that's a healthy thing. But, um, but that was my appreciation of good food came from my mom. And then except for one thing that I would say wasn't so good. And I had an aunt who owned a potato chip factory. So on Saturdays, I I would get to go to the back of the potato chip plant and would fill up an empty three pound box with potato chips. And I filled it up with all the curly ones because they were the greasiest and the yummiest of all of the potato chips. So it was just, it was still understanding what good food was all about, even though the chips weren't so healthy, so to speak. And I learned that later on. But, but I started with all of this. And then but I did get away from it. I went to school to be a dietitian. And then I got to be a dietitian during the era of the fat-free craze. So everything I was telling clients was, oh, just don't put butter in it. Don't put cream. Just don't put anything good in that. And, and then just and go on your merry way. And no one really liked that advice. I'm like, I'm doing something wrong here. And then I realized that, well, what was all of the teachings that I had important for um, other than just to be part of a, a healthy growing, a, a healthy childhood. So I realized I needed to bring all of that nature, all of that good food back into my, my work as a dietitian. So I then went to culinary school and learned how to put butter and cream back into everything, unfortunately. But from that, I learned how to put everything together. I learned how to not necessarily take away from our food, but what can we add to our food to make it better for us? So that led me to more natural cooking and um, a, just a natural way of eating. But it was from that that I realized after kind of exploring more about what's going on in the environment, um, reading a lot more about the environment, and then realizing that what we cook, um, what the foods we choose, all of the, the entire food system, how much impact that really has on the environment in general and, and linked to climate change. And I didn't see that initially. Um, it was 
but it was after I watched, which I think a lot of people probably did, um, the movie Read the Book, An Inconvenient Truth, and I sat there. I was in the movie theater. I think probably one of the first people in New York to see that. I sat in the theater, and there was this call to action. I'm like, well, okay, so I want to do something. What can I do? And, and that's where I'm like, okay, I know how to write a cookbook. This is my way of making a contribution to have some kind of impact, and hopefully um, by way of Big Green Cookbook and, and what you're doing yourselves in your own kitchens and the, how you're preparing, how you're buying food, how you're preparing it, can all make a difference in the long run. So, so just kind of a, a short story of the long version of my life and how I got, and how I got to here. But, but it wasn't so much just about um, the food and about how you prepare it. But it was, um, it was, it was much more than just, just um, being natural. And a lot of that had to do with energy use. It had to do with waste. There were so many, so many different areas that go into the food system that it's, it's kind of hard to explain in a nutshell. And that's what I tried to do in this book. So let me share a few things with you that, that might be of interest. And these are some of the stats. And actually, I'm going to call on you. These are some of the stats that I ran across that really helped to kind of put this all together for me and really kind of shock the system. And hopefully, you'll find a little bit shocking, too, because it really will uh, help you realize where this all fits into play. So the first, we'll call this little pop quiz. So the first question, which is more responsible for global warming, a Big Mac or a BMW? Big Mac, yeah, very good. So yes, the burger. The burger is more responsible for global warming. And actually, uh, the entire international meat industry as a whole is re responsible for about 18% of all the greenhouse gas emissions. So unfortunately, that's, um, that's our meat industry. And it doesn't mean that we can't eat meat, but what it does mean is that we really need to try to curb how much meat that we are eating. So in that 18% figure, that's even more than, than transportation alone. So I thought that was really interesting, because so much we talk about um, buying a hybrid car, we talk about just different uses of energy, we talk about buying a different light bulb, but a lot of us don't talk about food, and this is where it all comes from. So here's another number. Our food system may be responsible for how much of all of the greenhouse gas emissions? A tenth, one twenty-fifth, one-fifth, one-third. One-third of all of the greenhouse gas emissions are created just from the food system alone. So all the different aspects of the food system from growing, production, transportation, packaging, all of that that goes into the food system. So, so that number, I thought, that, that alarmed me. And then taking that another level, just if you take the food system and you look at just food preparation and refrigeration, how much of a part of the food system do you think that is? That's another one third. So just what we do at home, regardless of what we're purchasing, but by the time we get home, it's how you're preparing this food. Are you just throwing something in the oven and wasting a lot of energy? Are you, um, are you keeping the refrigerator on full strength on really extra cold? Do you keep swinging the door open? Do you use your automatic ice maker? So all of those things make a difference. All right, this one, this number is out there in a lot of literature, so you might know this one. The average food travels from farm to plate in the United States about how many miles? How many? 3, Close, 1,500. I'm sure some, some probably travel 3,000 miles to get to farm, from farm to table. But compare that to from farmer's market to the farm, 60 miles is the average food. So that's one thing that we want to try to aim to do more of, is going to our farmer's market and choosing foods from there. So I'll, I'll throw out a couple more that are startling, but I have many more where this comes from. The oven itself, how much of a conventional oven, a conventional oven's energy is used for actually cooking the food? About 6%. So that means it's 94% hot air. So you're just basically cooking the oven when you're using the oven. <laughs> yeah, so it's a big waste of energy. So that's where, let's see if we can get away from that oven, use a toaster oven more often, use a microwave oven more often, or if you're using the oven, how to use it more energy efficiently, which is, is something I can chat with you about later. And let's, I'll go over, to, maybe two more. Okay, the, every time you swing open a hot oven, how much, how much degrees do you lose? How many degrees do you lose? 
25 to 50 degrees every time you swing open the oven. So I call that being a swinger, one kind of swinger. <laughs> That's a, neither one of the swingers are good to be, right? <laughs> or maybe one of them is better than the other. I don't know. <laughs> All right, last but not least, so end on a, on a methane note, which uh, as we're going to talk about food from here. The landfills are the biggest human-related source of methane in the United States. So how much do you think that is? Landfills, that's about a third of all of the methane emissions. And methane is so much more, um, has, creates so much more problem with the environment, relates to so much heavier greenhouse gases than carbon itself. So that's something that's a big concern with food waste. So if you have food waste and you're throwing it in the trash rather than throwing it in a compost bin, that's going to lead to that, all that extra packaging that may end up going to the landfill, all of that goes into methane emissions, which everyone kind of lumps together as carbon in the atmosphere. And that's even, what I thought was interesting with that stat, it's more than coal mining and it's more than manure management, all of that methane. So I think people think of cattle, they think of livestock sometimes when we hear of methane, or you, you think of just something that isn't very pleasant. Landfills, I guess, aren't very pleasant, but we don't usually relate it to food. So that's why I just wanted to throw those numbers out because I thought that they were really interesting. So let me share with you a few tools that I think are going to be important for you to, to learn to work with, and a lot of these are tools you probably already have. And then I'm going to do a little demo here for you of one of the recipes from the book, which I think is probably demonstrates a few techniques which, um, which I think are going to be helpful, just taking those techniques to other recipes that you do. And the tools itself, I think, are going to be interesting, just on you didn't realize that these are tools that, uh, these are tools that actually have an important role in green cooking. So let me get this one part going, though. I'm just putting in the pan right now, water. It's three cups of water and one cup of orzo. And we're going to, I hope that's heating up. Don't do this at home. <laughs> All right, it is heating up. So we're going to bring that to a boil. And um, it's a little different than normally what you do with orzo. Orzo is a pasta. So a lot of times you'll bring the water up to a boil. Then you might add the orzo. And then you, you cook it. So here I'm just doing that all together to try to save a little bit of energy. And I didn't use as much water as a recipe calls for. Normally, uh, like to cook any kind of pasta, it might say two quarts or three quarts of water, you usually can reduce that amount of water by about half, and you'll still have really good, um, your, your pasta will cook just fine with less water. So less energy to bring that water to a boil. All right, some other tools. A lid. So did we know what this is for? This is for <laughs> trapping the heat inside your pan, so you can use all of that extra heat. We're not going to do that right now so I can see this come to a boil. But a tight-fitting lid is important. So it doesn't have to be any special kind of pan that you use. Just make sure if you, with your lids, that they do fit. So that way it traps all the heat and you can use that extra heat as part of the cooking energy rather than the energy itself. What's this? <laughs> chef's knife, chef's knife, um, and I use this probably for more than uh, most people probably use their knives for, but I think of it kind of as my food processor. Um, I use it for small foods, for big foods, so um, it's not just for cooking major things. But I do suggest if you don't have a good knife, it's one of, I think, the most important tools for any kitchen, but especially when you're um, doing healthier cooking or you're cooking more eco-friendly, you're going to be probably using more fruits and vegetables, so that means a lot more chopping. So knowing how to use a knife properly, I think, is a very good idea. So um, I teach at the Institute of Culinary Education. They have knife skills class. I don't teach those, but I do recommend them because it does make life much more pleasant when you're, when you're preparing foods. But if you didn't already know, the best way to hold a chef's knife is not like this, but it's actually putting your thumb on the knife, on the side of the knife, and then your finger kind of wrapping around the chef's knife. So that way, when you're on the cutting board, rather than having it back like this, where it kind of moves all over the place, it's gripped down. You have much more control over the knife. So one little tip there with the knife. All right, and then we have microplane, zester, grater, and what you do with this. A lot of people will just take this and over their food, they'll just kind of go like this. But I think the better way to, to use this tool is just you kind of go down one time. You want to just, when you're zesting something, you just want the really colorful part of a citrus fruit, in this case, a lemon. And 
that's going to add a lot of flavor to your food. It helps you use more of that lemon than rather just squeezing the juice. So take advantage of that rind as well. And to get the, the lemon zest from this microplane grater, what do you do? So wipe it with your finger. What you do is whack. So, and all of the zest comes off of that. So you don't waste any of that zest when you try to kind of scrape it all off. So one little, one little trick with that. But something else to do with this is ginger, ginger root. And what I suggest with ginger root is leave the peel on. Don't worry about um, um, peeling the ginger before you actually um, grate that. It's going, to, I call that earth style. So whenever you can, try to keep the skins on and things that actually are edible. So think of it kind of like a potato skin. Um, just when you do that, just make sure it's, it's scrubbed well so you don't eat extra dirt as well, even though dirt probably has some good nutrients in it. But <laughs> I tend not to enjoy dirt very much. All right, so, all right. And then, ruler, what's this for? <laughs> snack, snack yourself when you don't eat your cooked green. That's what I think, but uh, no, actually a ruler is to help to measure foods. Like if you're, you want to cook something like a diced up potato and do um, a hash brown with a diced potato. If you have some dices that are an inch and some dices that are a quarter inch, they're going to cook at different times. So just having the, the, everything kind of being the right size, everything is going to be done at the same time. So you don't have to keep cooking something an extra amount of time in order for everything to be done. So that's, that's one use of a ruler. So I find that helpful. And this actually probably isn't eco-friendly in the making, but it's um, eco-friendly in that it will last forever. You just put it in the top of your dishwasher and you can wash it. That's where this came from last night. I put it in the top rack of my dishwasher. So, so it stays clean. How about this? this hammer thing, <laughs> it's the mallet. And this is, pretend this is a piece of steak. So we're going to take that piece of steak and you just whack. Oh, it doesn't usually sound that good, but <laughs> you just whack your steak. And it, that's your organic and grass-fed steak, preferably. And after you do that, you have a much thinner piece of meat. So that way, it's going to cook much faster. And it also means if you only have a small portion, let's say you do a three ounce steak, which probably is nothing like what some people are used to when they eat steaks, it's gonna make that three ounce steak look much larger. So that's kind of has a twofold uh, method with that. So and the same thing works, it works with chicken as well. So whenever, whenever you're preparing something, the thinner it is, the better it's going to be in terms of energy use. This, um, this is going to be for that lemon. And we're going to need some lemon juice, so I'm going to do this for you. But um, it's just, it's a reamer, so it's going to help to get all the, the lemon juice from here. And I do a lot of lemon and lime juices in my recipes, and it's going to add, add a lot of fresh flavors. And especially with the lemon, what lemon does is it helps to balance bitters. So if you're eating a lot more of those interesting leafy greens and you're not sure, oh, I don't know if I like this, it's really... a um, um, the lemon is going to help to kind of tone down those bitters, and it's going to make it that much more enjoyable. So, so you will eat much more of those. So th you can do this with a reamer, but you can also do this with, with a fork. A fork does the same thing if you don't have a reamer. So that is one thing. And then you can actually use this little cup. You can put little foods in here as well. You can drink from this. There's all sorts of things if you want to be really green um, to get another use out of that lemon. All right. And... One more tool. This is a timer. So we know how much time everything is cooking. And you don't cook anything a minute longer than you have to. So if you don't have a timer, I guess a lot of cell phones now have timers. So you can use that. But if you want to get one of these, you don't need the hour one. Because chances are, if you're cooking green, you're probably not cooking things hour long. Minute and seconds are, are good to have. So that's what, that's what this one is for. And let's see, a couple more tools. Misto. This is a bottle. You can buy this on, on Amazon, or you can buy this at um, Bed Bath & Beyond. So in a, just a bottle with like this little pump action, an empty bottle, and you put your own oil into it. Who, who has one of these already? Yeah. You love it, right? Yes, of course. <laughs> so instead of buying the can of the, the, uh, with the propellant in it, you can just use your own oil in this and spritz it on your food. So this is what food stylists do to make their food look prettier. <laughs> but you can do it for a few different things. One, you don't get as much oil. You won't waste oil. It will help things not stick to a pan. And when you are uh, doing 
kind of, uh, I, I guess, in your cooking with a pan that might not be uh, nonstick, because a lot of the nonstick pans aren't necessarily that eco-friendly. This is going to help something not stick. But it, it also is something that I suggest you spray the food rather than the pan. Because when you spray the pan, you are getting all that um, oil, all the rest of the pan that you don't need to cook with. So just spray the actual food. Like if it's a chicken breast, spray the chicken breast, because it's only the chicken that you want not to stick. It's not everything else. So it's a way just so you don't, so you don't waste anything. And how about this one? This is, nothing special here, but this is a bowl with a lid. That's what's special about this. It's a bowl with a lid. But make sure you have some of these. That They go in the microwave. You can store extra leftovers in these things. You don't have a little plastic um, bowls that you're going to throw away that you're not sure what they're made from. So, so this is something I like. I have lots of these. And they go into the dishwasher. I can, you can pretty much do anything with that. So these, I think, were just crate and barrel, something like that. So, so lots of different tools to use. And what I want to do at this point is demo one of the recipes, and then we'll do some chatting and see what kind of questions that you have. But the recipe that I have to share with you today is called, looks like Greek to me salad. So it's just kind of a, a Mediterranean style salad, but preferably with local ingredients. And it's something that that I enjoy just, you can probably enjoy this just about any time of the year. You don't have to use specific vegetables in it, but I'll show you which ones I'm using today. And the first thing I do with this recipe is I squeeze the lemon juice, which I already did, and then I'm going to add some olive oil to this. And this is just extra virgin olive oil. We all have bottles this size, right? <laughs> this is just a sample bottle. It was easy to travel with. So we're going to add about three tablespoons of olive oil. I think this is about four tablespoons in here. So there we go, about three tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil and a little bit of salt. And this, let's see, about three quarters tables, or three quarters teaspoon of salt, I think, would be good for this. And I use sea salt, but you can use any kind of salt that you like the taste of. I think it's important to like the taste of it, so you, um, I think you end up using less of it when you enjoy it, whereas we, some people keep salting food until they get some good flavor. And that never, that's never going to happen with one of those iodized table salts, like Morton iodized table salt not going to happen. So this is just a little sea salt here. And with this, this is just kind of a little vinaigrette. And I'm whisking that. And instead of a whisk, a fork, you can use as well. So that's what I, I brought today. And this is just going to create the lemon dressing. And the, the orzo itself, rather than rinsing it, and rather than rinsing it and under cold water, what I'm going to do is put the orzo directly into the lemon dressing. So it's going to help to soak up right into the orzo itself. And that way, you don't have to worry about all of that extra rinsing um, uh, waste of water. But one little, one little side tip there for regular pasta, if you're making like a pasta salad, you know, maybe rotini noodles or something like that. A lot of times people will drain them and then you'll rinse that under cold running water until they're cooled off. My suggestion, other than a lot of chefs think that that's just wrong to begin with, but my suggestion is uh, drain the pasta, put it back into the pot, put like three ice cubes in there and just kind of shake or stir around the pasta. And once the ice cubes are melted, you'll probably have kind of cooled off pasta. And that way, you've wasted very little water. You've, wa you've only used the amount of water that's in the ice cube. So, so that's just one little, one little thing that I have done with pasta salad. So at this, um, at this stage, once I have that, you can prepare the rest of your ingredients, but also make sure you have your, your orzo going. And once it comes up to a boil, which we are there in probably about five seconds, we are going to, this is the trick here, <laughs> everyone watching closely, they're like, ooh, <laughs> yay. <laughs> uh, we put, I will put the lid on now, all right, and turn it off. So that's, that's the trick there. That's what I call lid cooking. So instead of cooking the entire time, you're just cooking with the energy or the water that's the hot water that's already in there. You're trapping the rest of that, that energy that's in there. You don't need to do that with any kind of pot, with any kind of pasta. This lid cooking works. So let's say you're just making spaghetti. I don't put the spaghetti in with the water like I do with the orzo, but what I would do, bring the water up to boil, put your um, spaghetti into the water, kind of stir it in. And then once the water comes back up to a boil, which might take 10, 15 seconds, then put the lid on, turn off the 
electricity or the gas, whichever you're using, and then cook it in that lid cook it so you don't use any energy. You're lid cooking it for the exact amount of time that it normally would take to cook that pasta with energy use. So if a, a box of pasta said cook for 10 minutes, you would lid cook it for 10 minutes and it will be perfect pasta. So all those little steps can make a big difference. So it doesn't have to be using 20 different techniques to create lid cooking or to create this uh, kind of low energy or energy conscious cooking. Just, just a few things here and there is going to make a difference. Okay, so once you, you add your orzo, once that's drained, to the lemon juice, there are going to be other uh, ingredients we're going to want to add to that. So the ingredients we're going to add, let me just chop up a few more here. We're going to add arugula or use spinach or whatever kind of green that you have already. Mine's getting a little wilted, but it's still good. I feel sorry for it. If you want to use goat cheese, um, here is something that I do with goat cheese, and that's just to crumble it. You don't have to be, make a big mess. You can even do this like right from a package. You just take your fork and kind of, I do a lot with a fork, kind of just kind of twirl around in your, your cheese with that. And we do have a lot of local goat cheeses, so by all means, like even Coach Farm goat cheese would be something to, to look at. But this is something that is optional ingredients with this recipe, so use it if you really enjoy the cheese. But you don't have to use the cheese. Um, one thing that's really delicious if you don't use cheese is lemon zest. It's going to add a lot more tanginess, a lot more flavor, so you don't have to really go with that cheese for that, that tanginess that you normally get with goat cheese. Some scallions. And with the scallion, do you just use the green part? You use the green and the white part with a scallion. It's a leek that you generally don't want to use. Like all the greens are going to be kind of too tough to eat. But the scallion, you use the whole thing. So and with the scallion, what I suggest, kind of slice it at an angle. It's going to be a little prettier. So look at all the different aspects of preparation. So when you're, you're making something that might be a little healthier, we want to make sure it's presented in a very nice fashion. So, so here, just kind of slicing on an angle until you have all your scallion. This is an exceptionally large, exceptionally large scallion that I'm using. So we're going to add that. It's going to add a lot of that fresh onion flavor. You have no waste with this as well. All right. So that extra scallion. And we'll add that. Oh, we're just going to put that on the side for now. What else am I going to add? Oh, some tomatoes. And this is a bit... The grape tomatoes, they're one of the few tomatoes that all year round you can probably find relatively fresh grape tomatoes. And what I suggest is just, you can throw them in there if you're really in a hurry, but I like to slice them in half. Just adds a little bit more appeal, I guess. And I slice them right through that, that top of it so you everyone only gets like a half of that little root part of the, the tomato. So I do that with all my tomatoes so I don't actually waste any part of the tomato. The large, the large ones especially, I think that's much more important for. And herbs. Something with herbs. I like these little spinners, salad spinners. And salad spinners are great. It doesn't, uh, I have a big one and a small one, but if you're washing up some vegetables, this is really great rather than just rinsing and rinsing under the water to get vegetables clean, you can put them right into the salad spinner. So you just have a small amount of water that you're just soaking and spinning in if you choose to do that. And I have a few different herbs, but something with, with parsley, one herb that you can use. And with parsley, what I suggest, and a lot of herbs, what I suggest, look to see where the leaves are ending, and then you twist. So and you use all of that. So you don't have to go sit here and, OK, I'll use that leaf and that leaf and that leaf, where it takes an hour to go through all of your parsley and get all the leaves off. Just um, do a little twist like that. But, and also think about using some of the stems. So the stems are still going to be edible. And, and what I do a lot of times with the stems is I mince them up really finely. And then with those little tiny little tiny pieces of, of parsley. That's what I'd like add to add extra interest to a dish. It's like kind of like a garnish, but it's an edible garnish. So that's something that you can do with that. And let's see, just chop up a little bit more of this parsley. So you can just do kind of a rough chop of the parsley. And don't worry if you get some stems in there. It's all good nutrition. It's all good for us. So just if there's stems, 
you probably just don't want a big stem like that. And so just throwing a piece of parsley on a plate, this is not something that we want to do. We want edible garnishes. So um, you think about the ingredients that go into a dish. Since parsley goes into it, this is, this is fine. Go ahead and use, but I wouldn't use the, that whole stem for that one. But um, on other dishes, if parsley isn't in it, don't think about buying parsley just to add accent. Look to see what other ingredients are in there. All right, so there's your some parsley. You have your scallions. I'm getting a lot going on my board, huh? And some cucumber. And so with the cucumber, just make your slices. And then once you make your slices, then stand up the slices. And then make your little, I guess, matchsticks is something that you can call this. And then once you have your matchsticks, come back around and do your little dices. So there's something with a hothouse cucumber. It's basically seedless, even though they're kind of tiny edible seeds in the cucumber. And you can eat the whole thing, skin and all. And I love it, um, the skin, because it adds that extra color interest. So let's see if our pasta is done. What do we think? I set the timer and forgot to turn on the timer. So you usually want to use your timer if you have one. <laughs> and that was seven minutes, right? So seven minutes. So we take our pasta. We drain our pasta. And that must have been perfectly seven minutes. And then once your pasta is drained, then you add that to your dressing. All right, we'll pretend that's really well drained. So there we go. All right, and then just stir that right in to the lemon dressing. So this is going to absorb all of that wonderful lemon dressing, that lemon, that pinch of sea salt, and the olive oil, and cool that. And when you're cooling something, what I suggest is is let it cool maybe 30 minutes. Generally, most things I suggest let cool at room temperature about 30 minutes. And then refrigerate it. If you put the ref if this in the refrigerator right now to cool, it's going to bring the temperature down or take the make the temperature go higher for everything else. So that's going to waste a lot of extra energy. So whenever you can, 30 minutes is a good rule of thumb. Leave that on the counter. Once that's cool, then put it in the refrigerator. You might need to stir it a couple times just so it doesn't stick. But it should work pretty well. All right, so once that's done, then you have, I used two different boxes of orzo. So this one looks very different than the other one, but they're both orzo. Then you add all your other ingredients. So whatever kind of leaf that you want to add, your cheese if you want to, your scallion, tomatoes, add a lot of color, flavor, and herbs. A mixture of these, I just put a little mixture of herbs in there and your cucumber for a lot of crunch. So think about textures, too. The orzo is nice and soft. The cucumber, obviously crunchy. And at the very end, you can kind of sprinkle on. Sprinkle on some pine nuts. And I'm probably forgetting one ingredient. Which one? Oh, the, the lemon zest would be the other ingredient there. So just stir that together. And this just, it makes really a delicious salad. And you can, if you wanted to, you could probably add something like grilled chicken breast to this, but I suggest try to go as much as possible um, the vegetarian route, or what I call ecotarian. Has anyone heard of that term before, ecotarian? Uh, well, I thought I created it until I Googled it, of course, and then I found out someone else had come up with it before I did, so, um, so I can't lay the claim to the term, but I still like the term and still use it. So ecotarian is kind of like, how about flexitarian? Have you heard that term? So flexitarian is kind of um, where someone who eats vegetarian most of the time, but they have that flexibility if they really want to have a little bit of meat or a little bit of chicken or something like that. Um, so this basically an ecotarian would be like a flexitarian, but they're a green flexitarian. So they just generally are going to eat meat based or generally eat foods based on environmental sustainability. But if they really wanted to have a little bite of chicken or a little bite of beef, um, just make sure that it's very small and it's, it's um, raised in an eco-friendly way. So it might be a local farm. It might be um, raised uh, grass-fed beef, that kind of thing. So that's where the ecotarian term comes in. So how am I doing on time? Oh, I'm, I'm doing OK. Yeah, so is anyone getting hungry? Yeah. Ah, all right. <laughs> I have some parsley for you. Yes. <laughs> OK, well, then I want to, uh, luckily, I have time. Let me finish up with uh, 10 tips that I have for doing what I call a green over. And a green over is just basically a, a makeover. So you can make over your diet, you can make over your meal, you can make over a specific recipe. So in the book um, that I have, 
everything is done for you, so you don't have to think about it. Just prepare it, it's green, don't worry about it. So, but if you really have a favorite recipe, I'm like, I really would like to make this a little bit better for the environment overall. So what are some things that you can do? Uh, I have a few tips that I could share with you. And one of them, include a fruit or a veggie in every recipe. Does that sound daunting? Yeah. <laughs> I, but that was one of my goals when I was writing my cookbook. I said, I want to include a fruit or vegetable in every recipe, and I want to make sure it's seasonal, and how do I do this, and can I do this? And there's over 200 recipes in the book. It can be done, because every recipe has a fruit or vegetable. So, so think about ways that you can add fruits or vegetables, even if it's to a really extra yummy dish, like macaroni and cheese. Macaroni and cheese, I did one that has zucchini in it. So you have a little bit less of the cheesy stuff and a lot more of the vegetable, and that way it's going to be better overall when you incorporate that vegetable. So, um, and it, it adds a lot of flavor and color as well, so a lot of pluses for that. Number two, green size it. So, and that is, I guess in a lot of things, especially as a dietitian, I kind of talk about portion size and, and shrink size your portions, and, but we don't want to have less of everything. So it's not that we want to reduce all portions of foods because some foods we want more of, like vegetables, for instance. So I call it green size. So green size means just make whatever you're preparing um, bigger or smaller depending on what you're choosing. If it's seasonal produce, Green sizing produce means having more of it, but if it's green sizing beef, that means you want a little bit less of it. So my suggestion with that is, does anyone here eat beef? Or no one's going to admit it if they do. <laughs> okay, yeah, a lot of you. So um, the, my philosophy is that's fine, but perhaps have a goal in mind. My suggestion is three ounces maximum for, the, for a day. So and hopefully not every day, but if you do, when you have your meat, three ounces, and then of course you can just Use this to make it look bigger, right? <laughs> All right. Um, number three, put a lid on it. So, and that's, of course, what this is, right? We all know our lids. So, and anytime you use a recipe, think about that. And one little thing that I did was I wanted to see, because I read everywhere that when you bring water to boil, put the lid on, and then it's going to come to a boil faster. Well, what I found was there isn't that much difference when you're dealing with kind of small amount of water. If you're dealing with big vats of water, I think in the long run, yes, it will make a difference. But what I found was if I put the lid on something and I wanted to bring the water to a boil, it came to a boil like five minutes before I realized it was boiling because I couldn't see it. So, so I think in the long run, it's probably helpful not to put a lid on to bring the water to boil, but use it much more during or after cooking. So trap whatever you can in, and use that lid efficiently for an eco-friendly eco cooking. And number four, say hello to hypercooking. So have you guys heard of hypermiling? I, someone, came, someone said just the other day that that was voted like the most popular word of last year, popular new word, but a lot of people don't know what hypermiling is, but I got the idea of hypercooking from the philosophy of hypermiling, which means like if you're driving, you want to just use as much, um, take advantage of all the gas you possibly have in that car. So it means instead of idling the car, a lot of us probably don't even drive here. I know I don't drive, but instead of idling it, if you ever drive, um, it means, okay, just turn the car off it, rather than idle it for a long period of time. It means having the right amount of tire pressure so you use less gas. It means I'm um, using your cruise control if you're on the highway. So all of those things are considered part of hypermiling. You're taking advantage of every bit of gas. So I'm like, how can I apply that philosophy to cooking? So that's where hypercooking comes in. And I think one of my favorite is the version called hyperbaking, where you take advantage of every bit of that oven heat, because remember how much percentage of the oven actually goes to cooking the food? About, yeah, you guys are good. I was going to say 4%, but that was wrong. 6%, six, 6%, yes, uh, 6%. So how do we better use our oven? So one of my recipes I have in um, Big Green Cookbook is called Happy Planet Cookies. And I, the happy part is just, because the, ha the planet will be happier if you bake these cookies, I guess. So. Or the chocolate part, I guess, makes us happy. So there's a couple reasons why they're happy. But I hyper-bake those. So I thought it was, rather than use a toaster oven, and to a toaster oven, you're using about half the energy of a regular oven. But it, in, to bake a big batch of cookies, you're going to need to use the toaster oven for probably an hour to bake all the cookies. So I'm like, oh, well, that's not going to be efficient to use a toaster oven in that case. So let me just use the regular oven. But instead of preheating the oven, just put the cookies in on the cookie trays before you preheat. Put the cookies in, close the oven, turn on the oven, whatever the temperature is supposed to be, like 350. 
And then once the cookies, basically by the time 350 is reached, or by the time the cookie is about cookie shape but not completely done, that's when you turn off the oven. So when you just, the, the key is not to peak, just kind of use the oven looking glass so you keep that heat trapped in there. So you can kind of take much more advantage of the preheat and the tail end of that cooking. So it took, unfortunately it took me five tries to get this recipe right in this book, but if you try it with your own recipes, every oven is gonna cook a little differently. So give it a shot and, and see if you can prepare your own recipe that way. And if you don't wanna go all the way to the I thought it used to, I called it extreme before, but I really don't think it's that extreme. It's kind of been part of what I do naturally now. But just by turning off your oven five minutes before the end of baking, that alone is gonna make a difference. So, so th think about that. Uh, get skinny, we already talked about that. That doesn't mean you, even though everyone here looks pretty skinny to me. But just uh, make your food as skinny as possible so it cooks faster. But that even if, it, it applies even to going out to a restaurant. So like if you're at a pasta restaurant and you want, uh, I want a pasta dish, choosing something like angel hair versus fettuccine, the angel hair is gonna cook much faster. So if they started with um, one of the packaged mixes, so think about um, every, not just at home, but when you're in restaurants too. Cooking by season, always going to be important. I think everyone knows that. But, but I think what some people find is difficult is that, well, I don't know what's in season, and then I, I keep looking at these charts, and I get conflicting information, and what do I do? And so I think that most helpful thing, just go to the farmer's market. If it's at the farmer's market, it's, it's in season. So that's gonna be a way, just don't worry about it. Just go to the farmer's market. And we have so many, we're lucky um, where we live. Or you can go to Whole Foods. Whole Foods generally is gonna be a, a good option for knowing what's in season. And they actually have uh, now on this, on signs in the produce section where food comes from. So you do have a choice. If you wanna buy something that came f nearby or from further away, you, you know where it's coming from. And another one here, stay in the 20 MPM cooking zone. So MPM is minutes per meal cooking zone. So I thought I was clever, but it's probably corny, right? <laughs> so 20 MPM, and that means a lot of, uh, one way to prepare greener food is to by preparing things in bulk or in large batches. So let's say you wanted to do everything on Sunday, prepare it for the week, and you think, okay, well this 20 MPM, I'm like, I have to cook this for an hour. That's okay, just think about how many meals you're getting from that large batch that you're preparing. So let's say the large batch, it takes an hour to prepare it, an hour to cook it, but it's gonna make six meals. So I can do the math, right? That means 10 minutes per meal is what that amounts to. So that's going to be an energy efficient way to use your oven if you're doing something like that. So rather than preparing that meal seven times or six times in a week, whatever it might be. Uh, number, number nine, home style or earth style. I look at it either way. So home style means this is another good tool for your kitchen. So uh, this is not Le Creuset. This, oh, this is a Cuisinart. So <laughs> Le Creuset is too expensive, I think, so for the average person. But this is just stoneware. And what I love about stoneware is that this goes in the microwave. This goes in the oven, this goes in the um, dishwasher, in the freezer, goes to the table, has a nice pretty color if you like olive-ish green. So, so this way you wanna try to use dishes or serving bowls that, uh, are multi that multitask basically. So you don't have to keep transferring from bowl to bowl to bowl and you don't end up having to wash that many things. So it's good even if you're not doing this for a green reason but just to wash less dishes, I think that's, that's gonna be a good idea. And last but not least, waste not. Want not, waste not, I, don't, I forget how that goes, but waste not. So when we're preparing foods just like your parsley, and you um, have some extra stems, well, what can I do with those stems? So like I said, one thing, you can use that as a little bit of a garnish. You can use your lemons. You can make sure you zest that, use another part of the lemon. My suggestion is every time you have something left from a food, figure out how can I reuse that or repurpose it before I take something to recycling or before I compost that and, and unfortunately throw that in the trash if it might be. So like a can. Sure, it's recyclable. So if like a can of soup, let's say, or a can of beans, you use that. What else can I do with this can? Maybe it can be repurposed and use that as a chopstick holder. There's a lot of things that we can do before we actually send something to recycle. So just, um, I think a good rule of thumb is try to find one other use before you actually toss it out or, or do something else with it. Okay, so thank you very much.
So, and what questions, please? Are, are you all doing green cooking? Or you think it's green cooking? No comment. <laughs> who, who has changed something that they have done uh, recently with how they're pre preparing because they think it's going to be greener? What's, what have you done? Sure. Uh, tomatoes are not in season here unless, I mean, only in the summer. And um, I found that a good replacement sometimes can be apples. Mm. Like you can actually make salsa uh, with apples instead of tomatoes or guacamole with apples instead of tomatoes and it comes out quite nice. I mean, it's a little different taste, it's like sweeter. Sure. But it replaces pretty well. Absolutely, so great it's, idea. So it's worth trying apples. Yeah. Because yeah. like, apples in New York are like, you know, they store really well and they just are always available. Right, excellent. So yeah, you can make salsa out of many different fruits. And I, I love the apple idea, since we do have so many here. So, And actually, as I was researching for the book, I tried to figure out, well, if I really wanted to be the eco-friendliest I possibly could be in the United States, where would I live? And actually, it was California. It wasn't New York. But New York was actually pretty good. We're, we're lucky. We can get a lot of things in season. And if, if something isn't in season, you can make salsa with apples instead of tomatoes. So we do have options like that. So, so luckily, we're, we're, uh, we're doing OK over here. So good tip. So any, any questions or other tips? Yes. Preheating? Well, one, I think it's just, that's just the way we've always done things. So we've never thought that there was another way to do it. But another is to get proper browning. That's what a lot of um, chefs, and, and in culinary tradition, you generally are going to get a, a, a much more brown or a more caramelized finish when you preheat the oven. So the food goes in at the higher temperature. You kind of seal in some juices. But there's just, there's different techniques that you can use. And I think it's how we accept our foods, too. I think just getting used to the idea, of maybe I don't need that brown color, like on toast. Like maybe a lightly toasted piece of bread can be just as enjoyable as a dark toasted bread. And you just don't toast quite as long. So it's getting kind of just used to a different way of cooking and thinking about, well, how can I get that? crunchiness, if that's what the oven is going to do. So what I suggest with that is, let's say it's some kind of casserole, and you want like that crispy top on a casserole. Use the end of a box of crackers or cereal or something where you don't know what to do with these crumbs, and a lot of times they just end up getting trashed. Sprinkle them on the top right when you finish a dish, and you get that crispiness, but you don't have to bake it extra long. So there's just a lot of this can be just trying to use extra logic in the whole process, but trying to throw out the window a lot of, of the old traditions or techniques that you think the way you're supposed to do things, you, you're not supposed to necessarily preheat the oven. Maybe we, we were never supposed to preheat the oven. That's just what we got used to doing. So um, anyway, good, good um, question. Mm -hmm. I do have a question about boiling eggs, but first I want to, as a former professional baker, I wanted to chime in on the preheating thing. Uh -huh. uh, for breads of various kinds, if you don't preheat, you're going to end up with a big fluffy mess all over your oven. So <laughs> yeah. uh, you have to get that first intense heat. In fact, in baking, a lot of times we start with a temperature about 25 degrees higher than the baking temperature. And then once you put the item in the oven, you turn it down. That's for bread baking and stuff. Muffins mm. and so forth, uh, I would preheat the oven. Anyway. Got it. Boiling eggs. Uh, everybody's got a special way of boiling eggs. Do you use the lid cooking technique for boiling eggs? And yes. How do you, how do, you do it? Um, I put the egg and the water, like about an inch above the egg or the eggs, um, into the, the pan, put, um, bring it to a boil, put the lid on, turn it off. Nine minutes later, I take the, the um, I drain the water and I let the egg just sit. And then I, go I, I guess time's up, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Stop talking. Um, and then I let the eggs. I don't like put the egg, rinse the eggs under cold water. I don't put them in the refrigerator right away. So it's um, put them in the cold water, bring it to a boil, put the lid on, turn it off, let lid cook nine minutes, and then just let them sit like 30 minutes after the water is drained. And so that's, I think I, I included that in the book. So. You just cover them up and let them go until they cool off, and that's it. Um, you don't need to cover them up. Just let them kind of sit in a bowl. Sit in a bowl, yeah, or sit just in the, the pan, but off the heat. And that should work, so let me know. <laughs> OK. Yes. OK. Oh, OK, great. So other questions? Yes? When you say measure your food with the ruler, do you really mean measure each piece, or do you mean get a sense of what the size is? 
Yeah, that's, a, that's very good. Thank you for asking. So um, you'd probably be in the kitchen all day if you measured every single piece. So I suggest just use it as a guide. Measure a, a couple pieces, and then go, uh, go about your own chopping and dicing afterwards. So that way, um, um, you at least have everything about the same size. It doesn't have to be as precise as I probably made it sound. <laughs> OK, I forgot this one. This one. What, what do I use for this one? Potato masher. Yeah, potato masher. So there are some things that are actually better than um, the electric device that was meant to be a more modern way to do something. So rather than an electric mixer or a food processor, um, your old-fashioned potato masher is really going to be the best use of, or best way to make mashed potatoes. So you don't get that extra gumminess that you might get like in a food processor. It's nice to have a little bit of the chunks in it. But you can use this uh, more than just potatoes as well. So something that I did um, in, in the book, I did, I think it was a papaya recipe that I did. So I just mashed the papaya with the potato masher rather than putting, to make like a salsa or a sauce, a sauce in general out of the papaya. So think about other ways you can use that. And besides this, there's another use of a tool that you use your own hands rather than a, an electric food processor. That is your mortar and pestle. Does anyone have one of those? Or like you see them, but you're not quite sure what to do with them. Or sometimes guacamole is served at restaurants, and them are the, they're called molcajetes, even though I don't think I, I speak Spanish very well, so that's probably not how to say it. But molcajete sounds good anyway. Um, but um, just by pounding things with your hands, it's kind of it seems old fashioned, but I think it's something that's going to be new fashioned because it is a greener way to prepare food. Something like salsa, um, not even necessarily salsa, but um, pesto would be something instead of putting it in a food processor, you can just kind of uh, pound away and it kind of gets rid of your stress, kind of like your mallet. Would be a good good way to do that. So, and let me also, before I let you go, I wanted to um, give you a few rules here. So, one rule to go, go home rules. First rule, uh, prepare plant-based meals. So we all, know, do we all know what that is? What preparing plant-based meals means? <laughs> I will, I will tell you. So, so I, it's kind of the idea of being the egotarian, but it's just, um, think about your fruits and vegetables and grains as the center of the plate. So something that, that I did in Big Green Cookbook, I, instead of um, putting vegetables in a category called like side dishes, so green beans is a side dish. So that's what kind of a lot of us probably grew up with. You have your steak, your potato, and your side of green beans, whatever it might be. But I think just thinking of uh, that green bean, think of that as the center of the plate. So th um, doing like Szechuan green beans, I think is one of my recipes in here. Probably name something different. Szechuan style um, green beans. So it's like a stir fry. So think of that kind of how Asian cooking is, or, or thinking of stir fries in general. A lot of them are vegetable based, and the meat or the chicken is kind of thought of as a side dish. Uh, another way that I mean plant-based is think about other ways to get protein that's not the typical protein, not your animal-based protein. So that's where something like soy foods can come in. And I know in your cafeteria, I heard you have quite a bit of that. So you have um, tofu, and you have seitan, you have, what else did you have there? So tempeh, yeah, tempeh. So um, you have those options. So and, and what I love about soy foods is they are a complete protein. So it's the only way, if you're not eating animal, animal products like fish and chicken and, and beef, then soy foods are going to be one way that you can get that protein. So think of that as more of the center of the plate as well. So a couple different ways to do that. Um, two, rule, second rule of thumb, be an energy-wise cook. So just like all of the things that we were doing, what I suggest, though, is rather than trying to do all of these things, like the hyper-baking, hyper-cooking, the lid cooking, all of that, especially if your head is swelling with all these different ideas, where, where do I start? Just choose one way that you're going to reduce energy in cooking. So even if it's just, OK, every time I use the oven, I'm going to turn it off five minutes before I'm done. So just having that one little rule is going to make a big difference. And then once you get that kind of becomes old second nature, then kind of go the next, the next step. So taking things one, one step at a time, I think, is good in that way. It's going to be uh, one way to permanently, in, um, permanently have a greener eating style rather than getting overwhelmed at first, kind of like a diet where 
people kind of go cold turkey and they go on extreme diets and then they stick to it for a day. And then they're like, OK, I'm just going to go back to the way I used to do things. Kind of a similar idea. And the third one, which I talked about before, third rule of thumb, <clears throat> excuse me, getting all choked up, <laughs> eat by season. So, and that means, who, who goes to the farmer's market regularly? Yeah, OK. That's your mission. OK, farmers work regularly. <laughs> um, and that could just mean, even if you've never, if you never, never go, just go once this month and see what it's all about. Pick up something new and experiment with it and, and have a little bit of fun. So I think that's just, it's, it all kind of goes together. And um, something that, that I did, and, and a lot of us have the option to do here in New York, and I, I know they do in a lot of cities, is to join a CSA. The CSA is called a Community Supported Agriculture Group. So and what they'll do is they basically you buy into a farm is what you're doing with a lot of your neighbors. And then in the spring, summer, and fall, you go to a certain area and pick up your batch of, of uh, fruits and vegetables and eggs that come directly from this farm. And, and it's like going to a farmer's market, except for everything is already kind of picked out for you. And you just go with your bag, your recyclable bag. And, and then you just take it all home and you play with whatever the farm produced that week. And it's just, it's one way to be part of the community and talk to the farmers and know where everything is coming from. And I think it just, it makes everything all that much more, worth, more worthwhile. So thank you. Any, any last minute questions? OK, thank you so much for coming.